The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, there's been a lot of talk over the past five or six months about the state of Chinese development finance lending around the world. Now, this really became a prominent issue last year when the team at the Boston University's Global Development Policy Center released a report that showed lending from China's two largest policy banks. Now, if you're not familiar with what those banks are and who they are, it's the China Development Bank and the China Exim Bank. And that report said that lending fell from $75 billion in 2016 to just $4 billion in 2019. Now, that got a lot of people's attention. That report was then followed up by another report, also from BU's Global Development Policy Center, and together with the Inter-American Dialogue in Washington, that noted that for the first time since 2006, neither of those two policy banks issued a single loan in any country in Latin America or the Caribbean last year. So lots of changes happening on the development finance base with those two policy banks. And this has gotten a lot of people thinking that maybe, just maybe, the salad days of Chinese lending are now behind us. And so a couple theories might be fueling this. So one, China just doesn't need the quantity of resources from places like Latin America or Africa that it did 20 years ago. So maybe the desire to finance all of these projects That's one theory. Another theory is that China is simply running out of money, in part because last year was a big, big slowdown on the Chinese economy because of COVID-19, that they're going to devote a lot more money at home for domestic finance. And so the, the, the appetite for taking on that amount of risk just isn't there anymore. There's a lot of speculation and no one really knows for sure. But if you're among those who think China's getting out of the development finance game altogether, then most experts in the field will tell you that's a pretty serious misreading of the situation. Kobus, what we're hearing over and over again is that Chinese lending practices are changing, but they are definitely not ending. Yes, this is it's, this is very interesting. It looks like the the number of, of Chinese players involved in lending is is going to change. Um, like the terms of, of the of the loans might change, and you know there's clearly um, some concern in Beijing about being about exposure to to countries, particularly countries in debt distress. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that the lending is is stopping. Well, this is definitely the case in Africa, and one of the the great things about looking at the situation in Africa is that we've now got a history that we can look back on in terms of 20 years of data on Chinese lending. That's the title of a new briefing paper that came out from the China Africa Research Initiative at Johns Hopkins University. It was written by research manager Kevin Acker and also Deborah Braudigam, who is the director of Kerry. We're going to get two perspectives today on that paper, but also talk to Kevin Gallagher, who's also a professor of global development policy at Boston University and director of the Global Development Policy Center. Both Kevin and Deborah join us from Boston and Washington. A very good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning to you. It's wonderful to have you both back on the program and to be able to kind of talk about where we are today. Kevin brings a perspective about what's going on in Latin America. Deborah obviously brings her background on Africa. Deborah, we're going to start first with some investigation into your new paper that you co-wrote with Kevin Acker. Let me just read a couple of the data points, and then I'd like to get your take on it. You said that China's loan, Chinese loan commitments from 2000 to 2019 in Africa now total $153 billion. At least 80% of those loans financed economic and social infrastructure projects, mostly transport, power, telecoms, and water. And one other point uh, is in 2019, Chinese financiers committed $7 billion to African borrowers, which was a decrease of 30% from the $9.9 billion that they did in 2018. So, Deborah, 
when we look at the 20 years of data that you have been collating and going through and preparing for those of us, what's the key takeaway from this new working paper and that you want us to, to kind of understand? I think the key takeaway is that Chinese lending is changing. And so what we see happening is that uh, China Exim Bank in particular has been easing off. And I think uh, Kevin Gallagher and Greg Chin did a very nice paper a few years ago, which pointed out that the policy banks, and in Africa, it's really been China Exim Bank, they take a kind of lead role. They go into these frontier areas. They go into these poor, weaker, lower capacity countries, and they kind of stake out the lending uh, landscape and start the uh, lending in these countries, which is really a way to drive business for Chinese companies. And then the other banks follow. So that happened with China Development Bank following um, almost 10 years after China Exim Bank had started lending in Africa, CDB came in. And then the other commercial banks have been following those two policy banks. And so we see now that Chinese banks are really taking a variety of forms. Um, one of the interesting developments is uh, syndicated loans. So we see them joining in with other Chinese banks, but also non-Chinese banks in providing finance in Africa. And Deborah, following up on that, do you see a change in the kinds of projects that they're that they're funding? And you know, kind of how do you how do you see the the entry of all of these these other banks, including many commercial banks, changing the the, the kinds of lending that that is done in Africa? The kinds of projects that are being financed really hasn't changed. It's the same thing. It's the infrastructure projects, and I think that's because there's such a steady demand uh, for infrastructure money in Africa. Everyone knows about the infrastructure deficit there. The estimates are anywhere from 50 to $100 billion a year uh, should be being spent by African countries on infrastructure. And there really isn't another um, strong source of supply of that kind of finance. And so we continue to see even in the current uh, even last year, that it's infrastructure that's getting this finance. So it's uh, electricity, roads, other forms of transport, water, telecoms, that's what African governments are borrowing for. And on the Chinese side, this supports what they're interested in, which is that, that Africa actually makes a pretty big business sector for Chinese construction companies. You know, Africa makes up about 4% of China's trade, but it's 30% of their construction market globally. That's huge. Kevin, when you look at the paper that Kevin and Deborah just published this week. What do you see in terms of similarities and differences with what the Chinese are doing in, in places like Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as other parts of the world that you follow at Boston University? Yeah, uh, with respect to Latin America, we see a, sim a similar trend where the policy banks are no longer the whole show. They're taking a lead in many cases, but you see other kinds of finance. As you noted before, our 2020 estimates for China in Latin America in terms of its two policy banks was the first year that there was zero uh, loans in that space. But one of the things that we see in the Americas is an uptick in equity. Um, there was $2.5 billion of, uh, of, of greenfield foreign direct investment in Latin America uh, last year. But in uh, 2019, there was a bit of a surge, uh, the highest in, in a decade, about $13.4 billion in, uh, in greenfield foreign direct investment. And mergers and acquisitions um, are, are also a key component of it. Uh, $7 billion in 2020, $4.3 billion in 2019. So like Deborah and Kevin's analysis, it's not, that, um, uh, it's not that the overall volume is disappearing, although it is lower in all cases, regardless of its equity, commercial finance, uh, or policy bank finance. It is lower than these peaks that we saw in 2017. That's, a, that's the case across the globe. Um, but we are seeing a diversification of actors, both in Latin America, that uh, parallels, uh, interestingly, with what Deborah and Kevin find in Africa. Deborah, um, now that there's many other financing players kind of entering entering the field, do you foresee that, that we're going to see a decline in concessional lending in relation to market lending? I think that's already happening. Uh, in China, the only bank that's uh, authorized to provide concessional lending is China Exim Bank. And as we see their lending shrinking compared to, it's still the largest lender, but compared to the other lenders, which are taking a larger role. 
uh, the other lenders only provide commercial finance. So China Exim Bank, um, their concessional lending, and they have two windows. They have the concessional loans, which are subsidized by the uh, Chinese central government, the Ministry of Finance. So those are a foreign aid instrument. And then they have what they call preferential export buyers credits. And there's some debate about whether these used to be finance also, they, they used to be subsidized by the central government. And there's some debate about whether or not the central government still provides those subsidies, given that the uh, interest rates are so low for China Exim Bank to issue its bonds that they may not need those subsidies. But in any case, that's a, a more modest part of even China Exim Bank's lending. They also have commercial loan windows, and that's where they're lending the majority of their finance in Africa, even in places like Ethiopia, as we saw with Ethiopia's railway, the um, Djibouti to Addis railway, that was uh, issued on commercial terms. And in Kenya, the standard gauge railway, it was a split uh, loan package and one part was concessional and the other part was commercial. So the concessional lending was always limited by the amount of finance that was available for those subsidies. And the commercial lending is less limited in that regard. But this is a real point of contention between China and other members of the G20 who are participating in the debt service suspension initiative in terms of whether the policy banks should be, you know, should include their commercial loans as part of the DSSI. And people like David Malpass at the World Bank and a lot of stakeholders in the US and Europe seem to be very perplexed, frustrated, angry, put the adjective that you want in there, in terms of the fact that the Chinese are not including commercial loans from their policy banks. I need you to help clarify something for me. China Development Bank does not provide concessional lending. They only provide commercial term lending. That's correct. Yeah. Wow. Okay. How does it work where they, you know, because the U.S. Exim Bank, my understanding, does not provide commercial lending. They use commercial banks to do that. They provide concessional lending. So China has mixed things up here. How is that playing out in the debt service suspension initiative and in some of the debt restructuring talks that are going on right now? Well, let me um, correct something on uh, what's happening at the DSSI and the G20. The, uh, it's true that China has not designated China Development Bank as an official bilateral creditor. And Kevin Gallagher and I have discussed this a lot. And both of us feel that uh, the situation for China Development Bank is somewhat ambiguous, um, but that we think they should be included under the G20. But nonetheless, uh, the position that Beijing is taking is that China Development Bank is lending on commercial terms and that they're uh, getting their finance on commercial terms as well. So they issue bonds. Now, of course, those bonds are backed by China's sovereign credit rating. And so they can issue those bonds at very good prices. So this helps. And China Development Bank also makes the case that they're, they are a commercial lender. And I think there's an interesting example from Germany. I was trying to find where is there another state-owned development bank that might have similar uh, characteristics as China Development Bank. And I found that IPEX, uh, KFW IPEX in Germany had a lot of similar characteristics. And I asked them if they were participating in the DSSI, and they said no, <laughs> that they were not. So that was an interesting example that, that um, sort of supported a little bit some of the, the position that Beijing had taken on China Development Bank. But on the other hand, China Exim Bank, from everything that we've seen, they are participating fully in the DSSI. So it's not just their preferential lending or their concessional lending that's part of the DSSI, it's all of their lending. And so when we see, for example, the negotiations in Angola, it was all of China Exim Bank's lending that was provided that uh, got the DSSI terms in Angola, not just part of it. If I could uh, add something here, because there's a lot of confusion about all this. Uh, the China Development Bank uh, offers commercial rates, but it doesn't have commercial intent, whereas IB ICBC or the Bank of China has 100% commercial intents. They want to look at a rate of return on a particular project that is commercial. Um, the China Development Bank is still a policy bank, and it offers commercial terms. Uh, and an analogous institution is the World Bank, the uh, IBRD, which offers what we call non-concessional rates. Concessional rates are subsidized like the uh, Export-Import Bank of China, the way that uh, that Deborah just mentioned it, but non-concessional finance just means that the China Development Bank has some base capital, 
that is backed by the Chinese government because it's a state-owned institution, and it issues bonds in, in markets and on lends uh, those, uh, the proceeds from those bonds to host countries at commercial rates at the same way that the World Bank would. All right, but for public policy purposes that are tuned to Beijing. Um, and so it's a non-concessional policy bank that raises money commercially and on lends those commercially. Those are the best rates that the China Development Bank can put together. Just like the World Bank, uh, because it's backed by the U.S. and Germany, which have AAA credit ratings um, and interest rates are really low, they can raise money cheaper than Tanzania would be able to. Uh, in capital markets and then on lend that finance to Tanzania. China does the same thing through the China Development Bank, although the reason why the Chinese rates are more expensive is because China doesn't have a AAA credit rating. Um, China does, the, the government of China does put CBD, CDB, excuse me, in an odd, odd category. It, it, it makes it gray. Even though it's a non-concessional uh, policy bank there in DSSI, they're talking about it as, a, as if it was ICBC or Bank of China. Uh, Deborah and I both think that that's, uh, that that's not quite correct. But the other thing that we all need to understand also is that the China Development Bank is voluntarily participating, to quote China in the DSSI, but China isn't including that number in the last time they reported it. They said that uh, Chinese entities have, uh, have reprofiled or renegotiated about $2.1 billion worth of debt. Uh, that did not include the China Development Bank or ICBC and some of the other banks, which some of them have been voluntarily participating. So, Deborah, if these banks are behaving essentially like, as you pointed out, the Germans and, as Kevin pointed out, like the World Bank, why are they getting so much grief from stakeholders in the U.S. and Europe about the role of the CDB in the DSSI? I think uh, there are two reasons. Uh, uh, let me point out something else about CDB. It's um, CDB has evolved at several different points. Um, and I think there was an intention in 2008 to make CDB a fully commercial bank. That was what the CDB leaders wanted. And then the global financial crisis happened. So just as they had uh, legally changed their form in China, the global financial crisis hit and Beijing decided they really needed them to stay a policy bank so that they could direct more of that lending. So um, from 2008 to about 2015, um, they were partly commercial and partly uh, policy bank. And then in 2015, they seem to have changed uh, their status again. They changed their name. So there's been another shift that we're still trying to understand uh, in 2015. So there really is this kind of hybrid character where in Africa, I can see how they carry out some of the policy intentions. For example, there was a FOCAC announcement, uh, the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, um, that, that China would offer small and medium enterprise loans. And CDB was tasked with doing that. And so they issued these loans, which are going out country by country. And it's kind of a line of credit that they provide to African banks. So that's definitely a policy um, outcome, you know, something they were directed to do. But then we see a lot of other lending, which seems to be pretty much commercial in nature. So they really do have that hybrid character. Now, why has it been so controversial? Well, I think one thing is that people really didn't understand just um, how much lending and, and where the CDB lending is going. And so, for example, in the DSSI countries, if you look at them as a whole, um, there, there are not that many that are actually getting finance from China Development Bank. And the one exception, and it's huge, is Angola. And so um, our first crack at analyzing this showed that 80% of China Development Bank's lending in Africa, uh, two countries that were eligible to the, for the DSSI and had chosen to participate in it, 80% of that was going to Angola. And as Kevin Gallagher just pointed out, um, China Development Bank has done restructuring in Angola, and it's not on DSSI terms, so it's different. It's actually longer um, than the they've provided principal repayment suspension for a longer period than the DSSI called for, but they didn't suspend interest. So in that sense, the terms are different, uh, but they have um, operated to suspend uh, lending or to suspend uh, principal repayments in their largest borrower in Africa. 
And we've also seen this in Zambia, which is another, not that big, but another participant in the DSSI. So China Development Bank is providing ad hoc, that's what we call it, ad hoc um, debt relief in some of the countries that uh, in Africa where they've been lending. So we haven't seen this yet in Ethiopia, and I think it'd be really interesting to see what's happening there. But uh, Ethiopia has been pretty tight-lipped about what's going on. Deborah, um, in the paper, you you mentioned that that a lot of people have been predicting that resource-backed loans is is gonna gonna you know disappear slowly, um, particularly you know um, because uh, because of of the example of Angola, um, you know, which which ended up so so kind of deep in the hole um, among others among other reasons because of changes in oil, in the oil price. But you also point out that actually that resource-backed loans are not disappearing and that they're actually changing changing shape. Um, like, can you talk us through like how resource-backed loans are, are, are changing at the moment? Well, as you pointed out there, Kobus, it's uh, countries that were receiving these resource-backed loans for oil that are not getting them now. And along with Angola, we can point to the Republic of China, which also had resource-secured loans uh, with oil. So the, it doesn't look as though they're going to be borrowing uh, on that basis. Certainly Angola has forsworn this under pressure from the IMF, which has, had helped them uh, out of the hole recently, uh, the hole that they sank into when oil prices went from $100 a barrel to just over 40. So that provided a, a, a huge challenge for Angola and the Republic of Congo. But what we're seeing is that um, uh, countries like Ghana and Guinea are now moving into resource secured lending. And what we see there is that in Ghana, um, it's a Chinese company, Sino Hydro, that's providing uh, the finance for this. And they're doing it with bauxite. So bauxite, um, China has a lot of demand for aluminum, which bauxite is the raw material that makes aluminum. And aluminum is what we need for uh, very lightweight electric cars. So they need to be made out of aluminum. And so there's going to be a strong demand as the, as the world moves further and further down the electric car route and other forms of electric transport. So um, bauxite is... Uh, is what is securing some of the lending in Ghana for infrastructure. And the, the Chinese model, I know there's been a lot of um, publicity. There's a, the Natural Resource Governance did a paper last year, right before the COVID crisis hit about resource secured lending and, and they were fairly critical of it. And I think there's a lot to be critical of, but what's interesting about the Chinese model is that um, whereas most resource secured lending is just finance going in, like from these commodity traders, and you can see this in places like the ROC or CHAD, uh, where the commodity traders have gotten into trouble with their resource secured loans, but they just basically send the money in and then those countries can use it for whatever they want and you know, it can be embezzled, it can go into public sector salaries, it can go into a lot of different things. But the Chinese model is to have that resource secured lending go into infrastructure projects. And the money actually doesn't ever uh, enter uh, the country. It stays in China and it pays for the contractors who then carry out the projects in the country. And so in a, in a very, um, a country with weak capacity, it actually allows some of that, it, it acts as an agency of restraint and it ensures that at least some of the um, the resource money that they're earning, which otherwise would go into sort of resource curse kinds of uh, issues that so many uh, countries with weak capacity have faced, it would go, it goes into infrastructure. And so I think in, in some ways it does have an advantage. And China certainly found this to be an advantage as they were uh, starting to move into the market in the late 1970s. And they got a $10 billion resource secured line of credit from Japan. So and Jap Japanese countries then did that work in China. So I think the Chinese see that it worked for them in the past, and they think this can be one tool that still has potential in places like Africa today. Kevin, Deborah pointed out about what's going on in Ghana and Guinea. In Ghana, it's the bauxite mine with Sinohydro. In Guinea, it's the Samandu iron ore mine that are still using that resource for in infrastructure loans. And is that model also playing out in Latin America? And let me just remind everybody that, that China is looking a lot more at Latin America the way it did at Africa 20 years ago. The Chinese foreign ministry a couple of weeks ago was very proud in tweeting out that for the third straight year in a row, 
China Latin America trade hit three hundred billion dollars, which is almost a third larger than the trade is doing with Africa. The investments that the Chinese are making in Brazil, Argentina, Chile are enormous. They're very diversified from soy to oil to minerals to agriculture. And so, are we seeing the same kind of evolutions that Deborah's talking about in Africa, or is something is it the old way of the RFI loans that that the Chinese have uh, tried and true? Yeah, Deborah and I wrote an article a few years ago called Bartering Globalization, China's Commodity-Backed Finance in Africa and Latin America. And at the time, we had found that in both regions, uh, this, these commodity-backed loans were about, were about half of the total. And as Deborah and Kevin show in their new, uh, in their new paper, that, um, that that's gone down sc- Considerably, but the composition, but the composition has changed into into some different commodities. In the Latin American case, so far they had they've always been secured to oil, um, and that those those have reduced even more so than in the African case. There haven't been too too many of them. One reason uh, is related to the IMF, as Deborah mentioned. The IMF is is uh, is quite critical of these and. Almost all of the China Latin America finance is concentrated in Argentina, Ecuador, Brazil, and Venezuela. And Argentina and Ecuador are under some pretty tight uh, IMF conditionality programs where um, these these weren't explicitly part of it. But obviously, China uh, the IMF has has much more leeway. I think uh, Deborah also mentioned that 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 this is this is something that China did at home, and I think this is part of the China model that doesn't export so well. Uh, the China Development Bank, um, when it was financing uh, programs and projects on the mainland, uh, they would look at a, a, a particular province and say, "Gosh, uh, uh, you know, we we can we can finance all sorts of manufacturing here," uh, and the. Uh, local government would create a special purpose vehicle uh, for a loan from the China Development Bank, and the collateral would be the land prices around the region. And of course, if China's going to build also, if the China Development Bank is going to build manufacturing and these these centers became the global centers of manufacturing, it had a significant increase in the impact of uh, real estate prices over time and the land price ar- around there. When you export that globally, though, to oil or bauxite or cocoa beans, um, there isn't a one-to-one relationship between the loan for a particular infrastructure project and the price of that particular commodity. Obviously, commodity prices are among the most volatile in the world. Um, uh, and so it, it hasn't worked as cleanly as it did on the mainland. Now, China's reaction to that is, well, you have to remember that our loans are long term and that we're patient um, and that over a 15 year loan uh, on net, they'll they'll claim that it'll still be beneficial for for both sides of the banking ledger. We'll have to see um, how that how that plays out in the long run. Kevin, um, we've seen a, a lot, a lot kind of more friendliness towards the idea of, of IMF issued special drawing rights over the last the last while, especially after you know after the election in the U.S. Um, how optimistic are you that that those are going to go ahead, and also how optimistic are you that they'll actually help? Uh, I'm very optimistic on on both ends. Um, the Trump administration was the last country uh, standing in the way of special drawing rights, and uh, the Biden administration, both in Janet Yellen's letter to the G20 and then uh, last week, um, the IMF uh, executive board also signaled uh, positive movement towards a $650 billion allocation which uh, likely be voted on in May or June, and countries would uh, start to see money in their balance sheets or SDRs on their balance sheets uh, by the end of the summer uh, or August, uh, since we're all on different seasonal calendars here. Uh, and Africa, at, around, at that much, would, uh, would get about $30 billion. Um, and so that's that's significant. At $650 billion, that's as, uh, basically as much as you could do without having to get official congressional approval. Um, and so the Africans will get $30 billion. That is for a new allocation of special drawing rights. I'm very optimistic about that. And $30 billion is nothing to, uh, uh, nothing, nothing to scoff at. Uh, from Ramaphosa to Ghana, uh, the, the region's been pretty consistent in saying, hey, we need about $100 billion here. Uh, they're getting some through debt relief, nowhere near as much. The 30 billion in SDRs will will be will be key. 
Another thing that's going that's being discussed around the SDR allocation is a reallocation mechanism. So Germany, France, Japan, China will likely not use their SDRs that come to them, although they'll get an outsized amount of them because SDRs are issued relative to the quota amount or the amount of base capital that a country puts into the IMF, which is a function of the size of their economy. Um, So that's why African countries are going to get relatively less. So there's a conversation about creating a reallocation mechanism where, say, Japan, France, the United States could voluntarily put some of their SDRs or online them into a vehicle that could then also make those uh, additional SDRs available to countries around the world. Um, and that the architecture of that is very much under debate and very much, uh, very much in play. But it looks like the, I'm also optimistic that there'll be some sort of reallocation mechanism that Africa will be able to, uh, to get access to as well. I'm a little surprised to hear that you're so optimistic that it's going to be smooth sailing in Washington, D.C. The Biden administration has indeed unblocked the obstacles that, that the Trump administration put up. But in the Congress, Republicans are not happy about this at all. In fact, there was a very explosive exchange last week between Senator John Kennedy from Louisiana, a Republican, and Janet Yellen. And he really let her have it, saying that these SDRs are as a blank check for China for Russia, for Iran and Venezuela. Uh, French Hill, who is a congressman from uh, Arkansas, has been hitting the Wall Street Journal opinion page. The Wall Street Journal editorial page came out against it. It looks like that the Biden administration is going to have to fight for this. And I'm not convinced that conservative Democrats are going to be on the side of this either. Do you feel that the politics in the United States are truly that conducive to let this happen? Well, that's number one, why the number has to be under $680 billion, because you only have to notify Congress, although Congress can make a big stink of it. And as we can see, some of them, uh, some of them already, already are. Uh, I think it is something that the Biden administration is going to fight for. It's really key for the United States to regain its standing in the world um, and to practice what we've preached uh, here in the U.S. We put together billions of dollars of fiscal and monetary stimulus um, and while the rest of the world, especially in the African continent, they've uh, really had to suffer uh, from capital flight, from ballooning of debt, and there's not really any fiscal space to uh, to do that kind of stimulus packages that they've had. Um, if we want to uh, regain our standing, this is a this is a key thing about it. I think the Biden administration has to do a strong job, which I feel like Yellen has been in educating the public about what SDRs really are and what they aren't and what the implications that they w- will be. Um, and if countries uh, reduce their debt burdens, it's going to make the whole economy of the world better off. It's not, uh, it's not the 1990s anymore where the United States and Europe are close to three quarters of the world economy. Now we're less than half. And so when the rest of the world doesn't grow, neither do we. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa-China Reporting Project at the Wits University Journalism Department in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at WitsChinaAfrica or visit AfricaChinaReporting.co.za. Deborah, just returning to, to our co- earlier conversation about the DSSI, the, the, in, in its current form, the DSSI is, is scheduled to end at the end of June. Um, so I was wondering, I, I've, I've seen calls coming from, from, among others, from the UN for the extension of the DSSI. I was wondering if you think it, that'll happen and also, again, whether, whether you think it will be helpful. Uh, I think it will be extended. Um, They've been doing it every six months, every six months. And I know the UN has asked for it to be extended for a full year. I don't know if that'll happen. I think that um, the G20 seems to be taking it, and maybe this could be because China's there. China has always approached things as in a kind of experimental way or gradual way, you know, crossing the river by feeling the stones. And so I think their approach to extending um, the DSSI will be the same thing. Let's just see how it's working. Let's just see how long uh, it needs to happen. The one uh, strike against that would be that uh, there are high transaction costs uh, for the lenders. And this is since China is the largest uh, bilateral official creditor, and the DSSI only <laughs> goes for bilateral official credits. There aren't um, all the other 
all the other creditors out there, none of them are providing debt relief. And so I'll just point this out that in um, the China is providing about 22 percent. Uh, they uh, the debt in the DSSI eligible countries, about 22 percent of that is held by China. But that means that 78 percent is held by other lenders and none of them have provided any debt relief so far. And that's a point that the Chinese foreign ministry, Wang Yi, and lots of Chinese stakeholders have said repeatedly is that when it comes to the DSSI, that the Chinese have actually done more than most other countries, in fact. And that goes, again, counter to the narrative, not saying that to defend the Chinese in any way, but it does seem like there's a perception, at least in many parts of Africa, that the Chinese debt issue remains the critical debt issue. And it appears that the Chinese are engaged in a debt restructuring process in the major countries, Angola, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Zambia right now, where you hear from stakeholders, the, the, you don't hear the same concern that, they, that they're expressing about private creditor debt. So Deborah, right now, from the sources you have in Africa, what is the concern about Chinese debt restructuring? Because we just don't hear very much right now. Well, I have to say, Eric, that we're not hearing very much either, because it's, I think this is a function of not being able to do field work. But um, it's, I think things are happening behind the scenes. We can see what the Chinese are announcing in terms of the number of countries that, um, that they're negotiating the, the debt relief packages with. But when I mentioned the transaction costs, um, it's not, these are not stroke of the pen uh, activities. It's not as though the Chinese can just sit there in Beijing and say, okay, you know, all the countries that applied for it, boom, you get it. It's because they have to reconcile the books. And so they have to, the borrowers have to open their books, the Chinese have to open theirs, and they have to match up um, what are the uh, loans that are covered by this, what do the countries actually owe. And there's an issue that's not entirely clear to me um, but it seems to be that uh, the, the DSSI was negotiated so quickly and had very little uh, detail in it. There were very few rules to it. And so we can see this with, uh, for example, the controversy that erupted over China Development Bank. It was never really clear. There was a set of assumptions by some of the members that certain uh, banks would be included as bilateral official creditors. But there's no sort of global definition of what those uh, entities are. I know the United Nations has some definitions and it could be, uh, I, I looked actually at the United Nations uh, handbook on this, which is like 500 pages long and it's very <laughs> difficult to understand if you're not an accountant. So it's not that clear about what these different definitions are. And so there were other things that weren't clear either. So for example, what to do in cases of arrears. So the World Bank very clearly said that any country that is in arrears to the World Bank cannot participate in the DSSI. So this meant countries like Zimbabwe or Sudan um, couldn't participate. And the Chinese, um, it looks as though they have their own policy about arrears. And it, we could see this happening in Zambia, for example. There was some discussion that, uh, the, that some Chinese banks, at least, wanted arrears to be paid before they would provide debt relief. But it's not clear, was that China Development Bank? Was that China Exim Bank? So these are things that still, uh, that, that I'm trying to find out. And I think, you know, without being able to do um, field research or doing field research by Zoom, which is what I'm doing these days, uh, has a, you can get somewhere to, down the, the line to finding these things out, but there's still a lot that's been, it's kind of locked up in uh, these G20 meetings and in the bilateral negotiations, information that we don't have. Um, Kevin, you know, in, well, one of the big things, one of the big themes of 2020 has, has been the the kind of conflicting role between China as as a lender to Africa and and the fact that that many African countries are now also also have significant amounts of euro bond debt. Um, it, do you see a similar kind of dynamics taking place in Latin America? Um, and how do you see th this the the euro bond lender as this kind of figure? You know, in 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 the debt relief controversy, how how do you see that uh, that kind of playing out over the next few years? Yeah, it's it's quite different in in Latin America versus uh, versus Africa. In Latin America, it's it's overwhelmingly bondholder debt uh, with China, except for in a, a couple countries. Uh, really, really not a big big part of it. I think to to merge two these two questions together, uh, the big problem is is that the the G twenty schemes 
uh, while a st step in the right direction. They were really set up with uh, real inconsistent incentives uh, and, and no real transparency on, on how they work. And so China should be, uh, should be applauded to a certain extent on, on playing such a key role because when China's in Zambia, for example, they know that uh, renegotiating the debt and even restructuring it if they're going to uh, isn't necessarily going to help uh, Zambia get the fiscal space to attack the virus and protect the vulnerable. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to make it easier for them to pay bondholders in, in New York or London or pay the IMF or the, or the World Bank. By not having the private sector and the international financial institutions uh, be have to have compulsory activity in this, uh, the bilaterals, which are at most globally for emerging market and developing countries, uh, about 31 percent of the total debt burden, uh, bigger and bigger in Africa, um, that it makes them carry the whole weight, and uh, and that's a problem. Secondly, we don't we don't have any transparency. There wasn't a set of guidelines. Uh, there wasn't a, a picture of what one looks like, so that the next country in line can can go ahead and use it. So it's a it's a real it's a real problem to get the um, to get the international financial institutions involved. Uh, you have to be really careful because you don't want to play with their preferred creditor status. But in times in the past, there's two things that they've done. Uh, one is to sell some gold reserves. That's what they did during the HIPAA period. And another one that uh, many of us are proposing are that they could play a role in bringing the private sector to the table uh, in a similar manner as the Brady Bonds arrangements in the 1980s and the 1990s in Latin America. Multilateral development banks could provide guarantees if uh, private sector came to the table and swapped old debt for new debt at a discount, um, but then provided a guarantee for a certain period of time, uh, guaranteed by the multilateral development banks that the that those private sector actors would get their financing back through the COVID uh, COVID recession period. That's analogous to what happened during the during the Brady period. The MDBs are sitting on a lot of financing that they've just refused to lend since the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, there's new rules for credit rating agencies, and they've just been scared to uh, lend too much. And we estimate in a, in a paper a year ago that uh, the multilateral development banks are sitting on about $500 billion worth of financing that they could lend to developing countries without changing their AAA rating. Um, so if you took a fraction of that to create a guarantee fund, you could uh, have a carrot that would bring the private sector to the table to be meaningful. Um, and we've also noted that, uh, uh, like the Peterson Institute for International Economics has noted, that the United States could also have a stick with that um, and use an executive order to uh, prevent lawsuits through New York courts. Uh, we really got to get the private sector involved here. The, that's where the majority of the debt is in not necessarily the Zambias and the Angolas, uh, but the South Africas, uh, the Nigerias, and throughout Latin America. The World Bank estimates that about 120 million people were pushed into extreme poverty in 2020. Eight out of 10 of those people were in middle-income countries. Deborah, let's take a look ahead. This is a year that is going to be very important for China-Africa relations because of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation Summit that is coming up some point later this year. It's supposedly going to be held in Dakar, Senegal, but we're not really sure if it's going to be virtual or in person. Uh, Latin America has a similar forum called the CELAC Forum. They had one in 2019. I'm not quite sure. Kevin, do you know when the next one is scheduled to be for Latin America? Yeah, there isn't one on the radar screen as far as I know. Okay. So we'll focus on FOCAC right now. Deborah, in the past, the past two, for example, it was these big financing packages. China brought out its giant checkbook, $60 billion, then $60 billion again. We've seen the mood, as both you and, and Kevin's organization have detailed. There's been a change in what they're doing. Do you expect FOCAC this year to include that big number as they've done every year for the past 20 years? Or are we going to see a change that, that relates to some of the evolution of the development finance models that you guys are looking at? Well, we already saw a change in the last FOCAC. Um, the number was the same, but uh, the composition was different. And so in terms of uh, new lines of credit, new lending facilities, that was what didn't change. In fact, um, I don't remember the exact uh, numbers here, but what, what within that 60 billion, there were 
uh, there was more attention being paid to investment, so facilities for investment, um, and then some facilities that would be used to uh, to sponsor things like industrial development. So I expect that there, it's going to be <laughs> tough. I think the the Chinese will either continue uh, to try to make. Um, I think they're, they're, it's going to be very hard for them not to make a big announcement along those lines. But um, a lot of recipients in Africa, a lot of the governments there will be looking at that not just as new lending, but as new debt. And so it's always the other side. You know, when you provide a loan, it, it creates a debt. Uh, and so they're going to be much more sensitive to this idea of taking on new debt. So it will be a lot less attractive. So I imagine there will be more attention on what the Chinese will provide in terms of uh, foreign aid, you know, the grants, uh, interest-free loans, maybe concessional loans. So there will be, uh, they may emphasize that part of it, but that they will try to um, shift into uh, more resources into pledges of investment. And those are also a lot harder to track because we don't have good data on FDI flows. You know, there really isn't anyone that's tracking actual investments of FDI of China and Africa. I know there's, there's some effort to do that at uh, the American Enterprise Institute. Derek Scissors has a database, but everything there is $100 million and above. So it doesn't track anything underneath that level. And so, um, and then we don't even know the money coming out from China. A lot of it goes through Hong Kong, and then some of that recycles back into China. It goes off to other offshore financial centers. We don't really have good data in the aggregate for what's happening with FDI. So that's something I would really encourage someone who is interested in, in tracking data to, to set something up to track FDI. Future data. PhD project, I can see there, a future PhD project. <laughs> oh, no, no. It takes a, a lot more than a PhD project. It really takes a, a kind of a think tank investment. Kevin, obviously, one of the big reasons that that we keep talking about debt and why why you know debt is such a such an important China Africa issue is that is the the incredible need for infrastructure that that Deborah has, has mentioned. Um, it, do, do, are there any kind of moves, or is, is there a kind of you know? W blue sky thinking happening in finding other ways of financing infrastructure that doesn't necessarily balloon countries' debt levels? You know, this is, this is the, the trillions of dollar question of, of, of the hour. Um, the region has a massive infrastructure gap, as, as Deborah said. In a study with the Brookings Institute, we estimate that the region needs to be spending about 2.2% of GDP uh, additional than what they already are on infrastructure moving forward. And that's characteristic of the whole world right now. If you take seriously our commitments to the Paris Climate Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals, the next decade, uh, especially in Africa, where there's such a demographic change happening on, the next decade is supposed to be a decade of massive resource mobilization to literally lay the foundations for the 21st century, lower carbon, more socially inclusive economy. So this crisis couldn't have come at a worse time where it's an external shock uh, to emerging market and developing countries in general, but the African continent in, in particular, uh, which has put a lot of them on, uh, on, on alert. 40% uh, of, uh, of African countries were already considered in, at risk to be in debt distress or in debt distressed already before COVID. Uh, so there's a there's a group of, I don't know, 15 to 20 of them that can go to markets right now, but the rest of them already can't. And so the, the question of the hour is, how can these countries finance uh, trans, uh, transitions into significant infrastructure spending? And there's there's just it's it's a simple math thing that nobody likes to hear the answer. Number one is grant money. Number two is reduction of their overall uh, debt burdens. And number three are new sources of domestic and international financing. And for many countries, it'll have to be at a concessional, at a concessional level. Uh, these are the kinds of things that have been talked about at the G20. But as we talked about earlier, uh, the incentives have been misaligned and there's been a, a little too little happening thus far. Kevin, Deborah, I want to thank you both for taking the time out of your very busy schedules today to join us. And But also, you have another announcement today that in addition to the paper that was released this week, also about the organizations that both of you run. Deborah, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're announcing today? 
Well, I am thrilled to say that uh, the China Africa Research Initiative is now partnering with Kevin Gallagher's Global Development Policy Center. We're going to be transferring our China Africa loans database to Boston University. It's a process that's been underway over the past year and is something that we've been planning for. And uh, Kevin and his team, uh, together with Kevin Acker from our team, have been working at training their staff in our forensic internet sleuthing methodology, which is uh, something that we would like to patent in terms of our very careful investigation into each and every loan in our database. But I'm, I'm delighted that um, Kevin and I have been colleagues and collaborators for years. We share the same approach to research and we're both deeply grounded in, in area studies and field work. So data collection is one part of what we do, but uh, we also are engaged in, in research and, and interviews, field work, and that kind of evidence-based analysis is something that Boston University and Kevin and the Global Development Policy Center excel at. So I couldn't be more pleased that um, the China Africa Loans database is finding a, a new, a wonderful new home. Yeah, well, we're honored to uh, to partner with Sice Carey in this way. As Deborah said, we've been working together uh, on the Africa data for the past couple of years uh, to make this transition. But I should just say over a decade ago with Amos Irwin and Karen Koletsky, um, after seeing Deborah's work on China and Africa, those of us who were focusing on Latin America realized that we needed to do the same thing. We were smart academics from the beginning, make sure that we had similar methodology so the two could talk to each other. So we've always been uh, aspiring to apply the same kind of rigor that uh, Deborah's team has on the African continent in Latin America that led to others asking us to look at energy and to look at biodiversity. And whenever we've used Africa data in that, we've worked with, partnered with Sice Carey, and now we're just uh, making it official. Um, and we look forward to, to applying the same methodologies and coming up with rigorous uh, estimates on a regular basis on China and Africa alongside some of the other China uh, and overseas loans products that we have. Congratulations to both of you. Thank you both for joining us. Once again, Kevin Gallagher is a professor of global development policy at Boston University and also director of the Global Development Policy Center, also the new home of the China Africa uh, Research Initiatives Loan Database, and Deborah Braudigam, who is the professor of political economy at Johns Hopkins University and director of the China Africa Research Initiative, joins us from Washington, D.C. Uh, if people want to follow both of your organizations and what you both are reading and writing, Kevin, where can they find you? They can find us at www.bu.edu slash GDP uh, or follow us on, on Twitter at the Global Development Policy Center. You are also on Twitter too, right? Yes, I'm at, at Kevin P. Gallagher. Thank you. Okay. And Deborah, where can people find you? Well, I'm at the China Africa Research Initiative, which is S-A-I-S hyphen carry, C-A-R-I dot org. I also am on Twitter, but I don't tweet very much. So I'm D underscore Browd again. You're ghosting everybody. So uh, yeah. <laughs> Apologies. Well, thank you they both. too much. Thank you both for joining us. We really appreciate it. And we wish you best of luck in this new venture. Thank, thank you. you. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Kobus, it's kind of surreal talking to people like Kevin and Deborah because it's devoid of all of the hyperbole, of all of the fear, of all of the weirdness that comes when we talk about China, Africa debt or China, Latin America debt, debt traps, debt sustainability, you know, bankrupting, neocolonialism, all these things that kind of get mixed in. And even after 20 years of the Chinese being in Africa, it's still very much part of the discourse. And yet, having this very kind of rational conversation that is free of all the exaggerations is, for me, very refreshing. And I, I don't get this opportunity very often to talk to people like this. And so it was, uh, that was kind of exciting. Yeah, it's very exciting. This is why Kerry and, and the GDP Center um, at Boston University, why they do such, such essential work. 
like they, they, they managed to really give data and getting that data is hard work, as, as Deborah alluded to. Um, so they do the work and then they provide this, this, this really kind of platinum grade data um, and they provide the analysis that goes with it. You know, it's, 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 it's really, it's a very difficult thing to do and it's, and it's, it's an incredibly, incredibly valuable resource in the world. And it's exciting that Kerry will sit alongside what GDPU is doing at, you know, on Latin America. So we can kind of see side by side. And I think that cross-pollination, as I mentioned in the at the end of the show with Kevin, is so important. We're doing this more and more with what's happening in the Persian Gulf and the Middle East. We're also trying to bring in Latin America as well. Not to take away anything that's happening in Africa, but rather to put it as context. And as you've pointed out over and over again, and even Deborah alluded to this, that Africa in many ways is this experimental test bed for the Chinese on things like development finance. So she talked about how China Exim Bank feels their way through these things. And oftentimes Africa is the place that they do it first. So in that sense, if we're going to start seeing some new models coming up this year, we might see it around the FOCAC. And FOCAC is going to be very, very interesting. I'm not convinced that they're going to roll out the big checks like they did last time. Uh, they might play games with the number as they did in, you know, in the previous time where they take a 60 billion number, but it's all sorts of different ways of doing it. But Kobus, you've pointed out at, in a number of the previous summits from the TCAD in Japan to Russia to the Turkish summit on, with Africa, they didn't have any numbers. Are you expecting a big number at this year's FOCAC or do you think some of these drop-offs in development finance that both Kevin and Deborah's teams have researched will influence the the way they do business. Mm, it's always so difficult. Like I'm always very wary of predicting anything. But the um, what what we saw what we saw at TCAD, the, the Japanese summit, was that the in the the earlier TCAD, I think 2015, I think 20, 2016, um, they did have a number. Um, and then the, at the last TCAT summit in, in, in Yokohama, this time they, they didn't. And, and it was explicitly, the Japanese government said it was explicitly in, you know, in, from, from, because of a request from Japanese businesses to not have to have a, a kind of a target that they have to meet and then particularly also an embarrassing target that they didn't meet. Because for TCAT, they had to do some creative accounting to, to kind of to make up the number that they had pledged before. I, I tend to think that the, that the Chinese might find follow a similar approach uh, what i what i again like who am i to predict but the, you know kind of what what i would expect right now would be that they would like de-emphasize any any central unified number and instead announce a whole flurry of 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 new kind of new initiatives and new new kind of financing um instruments including maybe more focus on equity um but yeah you know kind of, it's going to be fascinating to see i think it might be a kind of a groundbreaking focus summit I think it is. And I think there's going to be a lot more talk about the digital Silk Road, the health Silk Road. This is the evolution of China's engagement in Africa away from the resource for infrastructure deals and the Angola model and some of the more traditional ways of development financing that, as we've seen over the past six, nine months, uh, have changed. And again, we're not saying that they're ending, but they are certainly are evolving. But China's strategy and engagement in Africa is also changing simply because at the end of the day, it doesn't need as many of the resources that it used to buy from Africa, in part because it's buying a lot more of those resources from places like the Persian Gulf and South America and Central Asia and other points along the Belt and Road. So expect also to see an evolution in terms of their priorities. And I think their priority is going to be far more on politics, security, digital, and health. Health, of course, being vaccines, but beyond vaccines, also remember the Chinese are very big on malaria as well. So development finance is going to be, you know, maybe a secondary issue. Well, it'll be interesting. Of course, we have no insight on this whatsoever. Last question to you. You know, again, the hard part that I have in trying to figure out everything going on, and I'm a little bit disappointed that Deborah is in no better position than I am in terms of figuring this out. I was hoping she was going to have all sorts of insights as to, you know, what's going on in the debt restructuring processes in these different countries right now. Again, we are not seeing the levels of concern that one would imagine about the levels of Chinese debt in places like Kenya, Zambia, Ethiopia, Angola, and Djibouti, where there are higher levels of Chinese debt. And in part, I my suspicion is that they are working, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. And those stakeholders from those different countries are saying, you know what, we're good on this. Where we are not good 
is on that private creditor debt, and they have not budged at all. Deborah also made the very interesting point that no one's really budged on the actual debt stock issue, that the quantity of debt has not been adjusted in any way. So I guess where do we stand right now when people come to you at SIA and say, what's your thought on Chinese debt restructuring and, and levels of Chinese debt and debt sustainability? What do you tell them right now? Uh, yeah, you know, kind of in the first place, you know, I think it's important to point out that that the on the Chinese side, the negotiations are incredibly opaque because obviously they also pursue a bilateral approach. But I, I can well imagine that for some African governments, this bilateral bilateral approach might be a kind of a comfort, you know, in the sense that you that you have these this kind of like set of players that you that you negotiate with and they they remain relatively stable, and you know. The, that you can, you know, and, and that you also know that China has some kind of political skin in the game as well, you know. So, so it's, you know, China, China is is politically leveraged in parts of Africa, and it and, and it, it puts a lot of value on those relationships. So, it, it it there's certain kinds of hardball that I think the Chinese would be less willing to play um, than I think some some of the commercial lenders to Africa. So, I think it, it seems to me that there there still needs to be a real reckoning with with the role. Of commercial lenders in Africa, particularly as Africa moves forward into into this this um, decade, because as Kevin pointed out, you know, Africa is going to have to pr- like install a lot of new infrastructure not not infrastructure not only infrastructure in general but climate change related infrastructure particularly. Um, so I think it's going to be really important to have some kind of international kind of reckoning about about. Uh, commercial lending in Africa and particularly also the the role of of governments like the UK and the US you know where a lot of a lot of these these lenders reside or where where the funds and so on that that, that do some of this lending are, are registered so you know it's I think this is going to be a really in, in, interesting and important issue but I also wonder what kind of crazy crisis will have to happen in order to have that become an international talking point that I'm, I'm not sure well, let's leave our conversation there. This is the kind of issue that we talk about every day. And with that is not an exaggeration. We update every detail that comes out on Chinese debt in Africa and increasingly not just in Africa, but also in other parts of the global south. We do that in our daily email newsletter. Both Kevin and Deborah are subscribers to that. We would love for you to join our community of readers. Today, we did a full deep dive analysis on uh, Wang Yi's tour of the Persian Gulf, uh, specifically the deal, the 25-year strategic partnership with Iran. So we're looking at Africa, again, in this broader context, rather than just focusing on exactly what's happening in Africa. But when the Chinese are doing big deals in vaccine production and oil and security in the Persian Gulf, it has an impact in Africa. So this is the kind of thing that we're writing about every single day in this email newsletter. It's super cheap, $7 a month for students and teachers, $15 a month for everybody else. We also have a discount on annual subscriptions. Uh, If you use the promo code podcast, we'll give you 20% off for life on your subscription. So go to chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe, use the promo code podcast and get 20% off. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another edition. Until then, thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa project to share your thoughts on today's show. Or follow the guys on Twitter, Eric's at Iolanda, and you can find Kobas at Stadenesk. For more information about the China Africa Project and to sign up for our free weekly email news brief, go to chinaafricaproject.com.